Thanks. Uh, thank you, Shira. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm Fir. Uh, really, thank you to all the organizers of this seminar for inviting me. And um, I would mention, okay, so as Shira said, I'm going to be talking about the approximation of generating function barcode for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. And I'll try to explain what these words mean and how we approximate it. And uh, this project is all joint work with uh, Pazit Chaim Kislev. And I would also mention that it's inspired, heavily inspired by uh, ideas of uh, Leonid Polterovich and Lev Bukhovsky. Okay, so my goal for, for the short time that we have is to define a conjugation invariant barcode of compactly supported Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, which is given as a composition. And uh, that can be numerically approximated using samples of generating functions for each element of the composition. Uh, okay, so a few preliminaries. Uh, suppose we have phi uh, compactly supported Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of R2n. Uh, we can consider its graph inside this twisted product of R2n with itself. It uh, sits uh, along the diagonal, which is denoted delta. Um, since this twisted product is symplectomorphic to the cotangent bundle T star of R2n, we get a Lagrangian submanifold, which we denote L phi, an exact Lagrangian submanifold. And because our uh, uh, diffeomorphism is compactly supported, uh, it coincides with the zero section L0 outside the compact set. And we can also consider this uh, L phi, this Lagrangian, as sitting inside the cotangent bundle of S2n. Then uh, we note uh, the following fact that uh, if phi is C1 close to the identity, this means that this graph projects diffeomorphically onto the diagonal. And so this Lagrangian projects diffeomorphically onto the zero section. And therefore this Lagrangian is the graph of some exact one form, ds, in which case we say that s, a function on R2n, is a generating function for this Lagrangian and for phi. And in the general case, we have this following definition. Uh, so in case our Hamiltonian diffeomorphism uh, this Lagrangian, uh, sorry, is not the graph of some one form, we can get a function which may have more variables. So it's a function from R to N times some RD. And we say that it's a generating function for a Lagrangian submanifold of the cotangent bundle if it satisfies this condition, uh, which roughly says that we look at the derivative in the base direction uh, along these points, which are fiber critical. And we also uh, request that uh, the derivative in the fiber direction uh, is transversal to zero. Okay, so this is uh, our generating functions, some facts that uh, we need to know about them. So um, non-degenerate fixed points of uh, our Hamiltonian diffeomorphism correspond to transversal intersection of the Lagrangian it generates with the zero section. Uh, which in turn corresponds to non-degenerate critical points of the function. So we have this correspondence between fixed points and critical points of the function. And next we say that S, uh, our generating function, is what's called a generating function quadratic at infinity, abbreviated here as GFQI, if it coincides with some uh, non-degenerate quadratic form in the fiber variable outside the compact set B. And in this case, we extend S and we can view it as a function on S to N times RD by adding the point at infinity. Um, another fact is that uh, if L for L, which is a Lagrangian submanifold of T star S to N, a Hamiltonian isotopic to the zero section, all generating functions quadratic at infinity are in fact equivalent. So this is a result that follows from a theorem by Vitor Bo. And I'm not really explaining here what equivalent means, but up to some operations that does not change the Lagrangian, uh, we have a certain kind of uniqueness. Uh, the second fact is that uh, for such Lagrangians, uh, Hamiltonian as a topic to the zero section, there always exists uh, a generating function periodic at infinity. This is a result from uh, Ludenbach and Sikorov. And so now we know that for each uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, we indeed have such functions, and we defined uh, what's called the generating function homology group of a uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphism phi with generating function quadratic at infinity s, and with respect to some value t, which is not a critical value of s, uh, by this definition. So we look at the relative homology of sublevel sets 
we look at the homology of sublevel set of S relative to some sublevel set which is uh, very small. Namely, it should be smaller than the minimum of that S takes on this compact set B. And I remind you that outside this compact set, S is just a quadratic form. Uh, moreover, we shift the grading of these homology groups by I, which is the index of the quadratic form. And then we have the result by Elisa Treino that says that these homology groups are indeed independent of the choice of generating function quadratic at infinity, and they're invariant under conjugation by simple ectomorphisms. Okay, so now we have our generating function homology and we want to construct a barcode. So I guess people here came across this, this uh, concept before, but let me uh, tell you again. Uh, so a barcode is actually quite a simple object. It's a combinatorial object. It's just a finite collection of intervals. In my case, our convention is this, the, these intervals are half open, half closed. And such, with, such that we are allowed to have right infinite uh, uh, rays. Okay, so bj might be infinite, and they might have some multiplicities. Um, another fact about barcodes is that the space of barcodes, as long as they have the same amount of infinite rays, carries a, a metric called the bottleneck distance, uh, defined as follows. So it's the infimum over all positive delta, such that we are allowed to remove small bars, length less than two delta, and then the remaining bar needs to be matched by moving their endpoints no more than delta. So this is a purely combinatorial object. And now I would like to tell you roughly how one can associate a, a barcode to, uh, from the, to get a barcode from the generating function homology. And for that, I'll just tell you about the case of a MOS function. So suppose we have a MOS function f on a compact manifold on S2, drawn here uh, roughly. So this function has uh, critical values. And these critical values give us a finite sequence of, let's say, vector spaces, assuming all the homologies here are over Z2, by looking at homologies of sublevel sets. So we get the homologies, the homology uh, a little after the first sublevel, the first critical value, then the second critical value, and so on. So we get a sequence of vector spaces and maps between them induced by the inclusion. So we have these maps pi ij, which goes from one level to uh, a, a higher level, and we say that a class in, a, in VI, we say that it is born at time TI if it did not exist before. What this means is it is not included in the image of the uh, map pi I minus one to I, which means that at time I, we actually get a new class that was not there before. And we say that this class dies at time TJ if Basically, it merges with, a, with an older class for the first time at level j. So namely, what is written here is that this first condition says that if we take the class alpha and take it into the level j minus 1, it is not in the image of the older map that comes from time i minus 1. But if we take it into a time j, then it's already is included in the image of an older map that comes from time i minus one. Okay, so in this example that's drawn here, if you consider the class of this critical point x, so it is born at time t ones and did not exist before in the earlier sublevel sets. And we say that it dies at time t three, since once we uh, get above this level, then x becomes a boundary, and so it vanishes. And in this case, it just merges with the zero class. Using this terminology, we get bars, ti, comma, tj, for all classes uh, represented by critical points that are born at time ti and die at time tj. And we also get a few infinite rays, ti, comma, infinity, for classes of critical points that uh, are born at time ti, but never dies. Okay, so these classes are sometimes called homological critical points and they recover the homology of the manifold. Okay, so now we want to play the same game and define a, a barcode. Out. So this, this way we can define a barcode out of the most function. And we want to play the same game for generating function quadratic at infinity. It's no longer defined on the compact manifold, but it works roughly the same. So let's keep the picture uh, inaccurate as it is. And, and now let's say that S is a generating function quadratic at infinity. 
we still get using generating function homology, we still get these finite sequence of vector spaces and maps between them. And I'll just say that we're using exactly the same procedure. We said that the generating function barcode B of phi is the barcode associated to this filtered homology given by generating function homology. Okay, so up until now we have a barcode. We claim that it's uh, indeed conjugation invariant. And I remind you our goal uh, is to say that this barcode can actually be numerically approximated using uh, an algorithm if we have samples of generating functions for uh, a few diffeomorphism that compose into a big one. Okay, so this is the suggested algorithm. Uh, suppose we have S1 through Sn, all of them know that all of them are function uh, without auxiliary variables on R2n, each of them generating some phi j, a compactly supported Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. And let's denote by uh, R a radius, uh, a common radius uh, that contains the compact support of all of them, and by T a common bound on their C1 distance from the identity. Recall that if this bound is small, then such function, such small function indeed exists. So the first step of the algorithm is using uh, something called composition formulas um, attributed to Chicano and Chaperon uh, that allows us to get an explicit um, expression of a function S, which is now defined on a space of much higher dimension, which is a generating function quadratic at infinity for the composition. So this is explicit, completely explicit. And this function will be equal to some quadratic form outside a compact set B. Then uh, our next step is to approximate our domain in some sense. So for this, we construct a pair of uh, finite cell complexes, K and L, that is homotopic to our domain, to S to N times RD, and L is homotopic to this sub-level set with a, a very small value, and with mesh one over M. By this, I mean simply these complexes are just we are taking a bunch of lattice points inside our domain. And by mesh one over M, we just um, ask that the maximum distance between neighboring points will be no more than one over M. So this will control the diameter of the cells. Uh, after we have these cell complexes, we sample the function S constructed from the small functions on our compact set and the lattice points. So note, very important. This is a finite set of points, a finite set of values, and we get a filtered complex. What I mean by a filtered complex, kt, l, is just every vertex now has a, a, has a value of s, and now we only look at level kt, we only look at cells with which all vertices has a value less than or equal to t. And okay, so that way we completely uh, um, explicitly compute boundary matrices, DJ, and uh, recall that the boundary matrices, their columns and rows correspond to cells, and we order them uh, according to the filtration. So cells with higher values of S comes to the right or lower than other cells. And then the last step of the algorithm is using a, a cool tool called the matrix reduction that comes from topological data analysis introduced by Edelsbrunner, Lescher, and Zomorodian that actually allows us to recover the barcode of this complex, a barcode, let's say, from, from the boundary matrices. So it's all just uh, elementary column operations that find the different bases for the homology, and you can really see when a class uh, is born and when a class dies. That way, you get a barcode. And the theorem says that uh, the bottleneck distance between the barcode given by this algorithm and the generating function barcode, or phi, is bounded by this quantity, just a, a constant that depends on the support radius and uh, something that depends on the dimension and number of functions uh, in the composition, which is n, the C1 distance, and of course the mesh parameter. So as you can see, when we take the mesh parameter to infinity, which means that we need to sample more and more points, then uh, this, this bottleneck distance indeed goes to zero and we get a good approximation. Uh, I would also mention that this algorithm, in principle, has a, a asymptotic uh, polynomial time complexity in the in the parameter m, the mesh parameter, 
And if we want to fix a certain error and get more and more complicated diffeomorphism in the sense that they are composed of more small ones, then we have super exponential uh, time complexity. Okay, so I'm okay, right? I think. Uh, so let's, I, I want, the last thing I want to tell you about is some computational experiment that we did with this algorithm. So we actually tried to uh, uh, implement it in some cases. So what we did is the following thing. We wrote a program in MATLAB that gets uh, some numbers, which are support radiuses and center points and profile functions. Then uh, with extra parameters, some bounds on the first and second derivative and mesh parameter. Then you take a center point and a support function, you define a Hamiltonian function, capital H, which is just a radial function given by this profile around the center point. And using the effect that uh, these generating functions satisfy the hamilton jacob equation, we can actually approximate samples of the small generating functions themselves. This is all in the case of R2, of course. So after we approximate the samples of the small generating functions themselves, we implemented the algorithm we discussed a minute ago, and we get a barcode with the following bottleneck distance bound. It's quite similar, but there are some extra terms here it comes from the fact that now the generating function themselves, the input is approximated as well. So I'll just show you one example of some computation that we did. So suppose you get, you, you take this uh, profile function, which is just a smooth step function like this. What you see here is its derivative. You do this procedure, you pick two symmetric center points, minus A and A in R2. You get one Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, which is just a rotation that goes the fastest here in the middle, corresponding to this value of the derivative. And then it decays and uh, its speed, the speed of the rotation decays along the boundary into the center. And you compose both of them. And what you get here in the overlap is that for certain values of A, you, we expected and we numerically estimated that we get some periodic orbits. So we looked for some um, points here that if you, if you compose phi and then psi, then you get back to the same place and we get some periodic orbits. We also numerically estimated the action of these orbits and indices. And we got some conjecture about what the barcode should be. Still relying on the fact that periodic orbits correspond to uh, critical points of the generating function. So in this case, in this picture here, where we have three periodic orbits for different values of A, it was it might be a different number of orbits, but for this case, this was the conjectured barcode. It's, it's like, this is what is drawn here. And our algorithm, once we uh, gave it these settings, uh, gave the following results. So if we looked at the estimated length of what should be the length of the longest finite bar of these guys, it was something in the order of magnitude of 10 to the minus two. And on the other hand, when we compared the bottleneck distance of the output of the algorithm with the actual conjectured barcode, we got a, a bottleneck distance, which is something like 10 to the minus six, which let's put aside these numbers, but this is much smaller than this one. And this tells us that the barcode given by algorithm should really see the real finite bars that uh, happen in the conjectured barcode. So it will not be, it will not disappear as noise or something. And these results were uh, really cool. And we ran a bunch of other cases with different values of A for this setup and all of them looked really good. There are some, some things that we wanted to run but, but couldn't for a computational reason, which I might discuss if somebody asked me in the, in the discussion time, but I think I will end with that and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? I have a, qu a question, J just uh, uh, a few, uh, could you please uh, go, go again through the approximation algorithm? I, 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 I'm a little bit, Exactly here, yes, yes, yes. So, so, so how do you construct the pair KL? So, okay, so again, 
what do what do I mean by construct a pair? By constructing a cell complex, a finite cell complex, explicitly what I mean is you compute boundary matrices. This is the data of a cell complex. So what we do here is we have our we have this domain, which is not really S to N times RD, but it's just uh, one ball in the base direct, in the base space, and one Euclidean ball in the fiber space. We take a bunch of lattice points in, this, in these two balls. We take from these lattice points, we take like the few, the full cubical complex. So we take all the, we take the lattice structure of, Z, of, of ZD and just take, the full cubical complex, we explicitly compute the boundary matrices. Then in the side of the first ball, we glue the, the boundary together to get S to N. Is it clear? Clear? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. And, so it's kind uh -huh. of a naive implementation. We just take all the cells that we can and do what we need to do and get a boundary matrix. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so you, you approximate uh, the sublevel set by, uh, by cubes. Yeah, exactly. Everything is cubes, and we approximate, and we we sample on the vertices, and we approximate sublevel set by a bunch of cubes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Can you say what's the computational problem? Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I mean, it, it, it's not really a problem, but it is something that's mysterious here because, on the one hand, we say that if we want uh, the the mesh parameter to grow then the complexity is polynomial and that's true but it's it's a kind of a sad fact that even polynomials have big values so and uh, if you if you go further enough and the the problem is that even in this example which looks i think very nice but the values of t actually the values the the the, the distance from the identity of each of the small hamiltonian diffeomorphism is very very small because once it gets larger the way that we implemented this algorithm, and it, it relates to the, the question that Igor asked, is, is in such a way that you need a really, a really large number of cells, most of them useless in our algorithm, but this is what you need in order to compute something. So if we wanted to compute a, a more interesting example, so which for me means that you need to compose more than two functions, you need to compose three or four or five functions, uh, so what this does, it, it increases the dimension. Um, and even in the case of five functions, if you want to uh, compose them, the way we, we implemented this, then the number of cells in the game is like 10 to the 25. It's, it's, it's too large uh, to, to, to really compute because you need to, do, um, you need to do operation on matrices, just too large. So, even we, we had some ideas about how to reduce the number of cells in, in this implementation, but it was kind of, uh, it, it's kind of difficult because even if you cut the number of cells in half, it's still too large. You need something else. So this is something, this is a process. Yeah, we, we're thinking about how one can really reduce the number of cells needed to compute this thing or maybe come from a different angle. I, I'm not sure. Do you have the same problem with when you increase the dimension? Versus like is the number of uh, com composed flows. This dimension and small n? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so as you see, the, the number, the, this is the domain of the function. At the end, we get a function. We need mm -hmm. to, to compute its more homology. So, yeah, so even if you agree small n, it's the same thing, but maybe that's, we can stop if n was, was two, <clears throat> small n was two, it would be interesting enough. But, but capital N, you need it to be three or four or five maybe more to get very interesting examples. Okay, can you go back to the example that you computed with two disks? So is your computation, so you're, from your computation of the barcode, you can know the existence of these like middle periodic orbits, right? So it, it's, it's kind sense. of, it, yeah, in some sense, yeah, but that's only if you trust our, our program, you know, because what we do ah, is try to come up with examples that we can compute or estimate in another way in order to test our program. So yeah, yeah, all yeah, the yeah. tests worked. So now if you trust our program, then you can run the barcode and see that there are two finite bars and know that there are the, the, the amount of periodic orbits that exists. What was your choice for MATLAB as opposed to like Mathematica or other software? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, uh, it, 
wasn't very educated choice. I mean, my collaborator Pazit just was more knew more MATLAB, and I knew nothing, and we chose MATLAB. But if I would need to do it over again, I maybe would pick a different language because th this implementation is far from perfect. It was just like a proof of concept. Okay, thanks. But I would guess it's still better, like using MATLAB than Mathematica for uh, numerical, like such numerical. Well, again, I'm, I'm, things. I'm still not an I mean, expert, you're, you're not doing a lot of symbolic. Uh, no, no, everything here is super, so, like, it, it's all of and it I think, uh, multiplying matrices. Yeah. Uh, seriously, this whole algorithm, what it does is multiplying matrices. MATLAB, but, by the way, also has deep learning libraries. So if you turn on like neural networks and then run your computation through that, that might help or not. I don't know, but just okay, that, that, that sounds like words I, that I don't fully understand, but sounds like like this can help. So I guess this this is the kind of ideas from the angle of computations that we can really make stuff better. So I'll check that out. Okay, thanks. Ophir again. Uh, can I 